Our opening issue today, Scion Issue 7, is the planned end for Scion's first story arc. CrossGen structured its collected editions in seven issue installments. This allows for a clear beginning, middle, and end to each grouping of issues. Issues 1 and 2 would kick things off, 3, 4, and 5 are the middle, they're the adventure part, while issues 6 and 7 wrap things up and then set up our next story. From a writing perspective, this gives every writer a framework to plan inside of and they can then write a complete story every seven issues. From an artistic perspective, Issue 7 also gives our regular creative team either some time off or a chance to work ahead. Every seventh issue of a cross-gen book was an artistic fill-in issue, unless there was some kind of creative team change happening in the book otherwise. In this case, Issue 7 of Scion was penciled by Rick Leonardi, inked by Carl Kessel, and it was colored by Paul Mounts. I was quite surprised when this issue first came out, and it featured Rick Leonardi as the artist drawing it. The only place that I had ever seen Rick Leonardi's artwork before this was on Marvel's Spider-Man 2099, where he drew the first 25 issues of that volume, and that was back in the early 90s. I found Leonardi's artwork to be sketchy and loose, but that honestly lent to it a sense of organicness. The lead character was muscular but thin, his costume was dark and foreboding. The tech of 2099 looked seamless and smooth, but not in the clean stylings of Apple or J.J. Abrams' Star Trek. Those are smooth and shiny, they look clean. 2099's look was much more worn and real. The world of 2099 was pretty dark, bleak, crowded, and was generally kind of... I mean, you you take a look at a rundown city today and you just extrapolate it a hundred years, and yeah, you kind of have 2099. It was super good. I've actually considered covering some of the 2099 books on the show. I just have the same problem with them that I have with CrossGen, which is I'm not sure what I want to start with, but someday we'll get there. Oddly enough, that was the only comic that I had ever seen Leonardi drawn. And what really happened was that after Spider-Man 2099, Leonardi just moved on to do books that I wasn't really reading. Until Scion Issue 7 was released. And wow, was I missing out. This is a gorgeous comic. And like all of Scion's issues look great to me, like there's no arguing that for me. But there's just something a little bit extra in this one. It is a beautiful send-off for Prince Artor, who was killed in battle against Prince Brawn last issue. I know that it's not polite to intrude on a family in mourning, but we kind of have to. That's just what this comic is. So, sorry, Prince Ethan, but my name is Ben, and this is Comic Book Breakdown episode 18.3, Scion, Threats and Promises. We open on a hole in the ground. But I'm not talking about a grave, just a small hole in the ground. A pair of hands lower a sapling into it. They then cover over the roots with the loose dirt, and the camera pulls out. Princes Kai and Ethan wipe their hands clean as they admire their work. Rose-like flowers of red and yellow bloom against the green leaves, a beautiful contrast. Rows of trees run behind them, flanking a nice stone path, which leads back to the Heron Castle. Both men are dressed in formal wear. Ethan, still kneeling, looks at the young tree. He would have liked this. Kai rests a hand on his younger brother's shoulder. Artor always did like this grove. Each tree represents a fallen member of the Heron dynasty. Kai believes that Artor liked the sense of history here. Ethan doesn't think that Artor expected to be here so soon, though, and with him to blame for it. Kai tries to shut that kind of talk down. Ethan might have been the flashpoint to this war, but he was not the cause. The enmity between the two nations is far older than that. But, but it's also pointless, Ethan argues. We won the battle at Point Corday, and for what? The war is going to go on, and more people are going to die. This time it was Artor. Who knows who it'll be next time? 
How many people will need to die before this war is over? And he also can't stop thinking about Ashley and the underground. There's just so much that he has to consider. Kai scoffs, telling Ethan that he thinks too much. Ethan stands. Well, you're next in line for the throne. Are you ready for that responsibility? Does it matter if he isn't, Kai asks? It's going to happen whether he wants it or not. Assuming his role of big brother, Kai adds that they need to move on. They're expected. The siblings do, heading into the castle. Before they exit the scene, Ethan says that he misses him. Kai puts an arm around his shoulder. I know. So do I. Really quickly, Mars gives us this issue's basic concept. The Heron family mourns the loss of Artor and must change and grow accordingly into the future. Ethan is already blaming himself for Artor's death, despite how ridiculous that belief is. Mars also has Ethan mention Ashley and the Underground, demonstrating that Ethan doesn't let things go easily. I could see a person, overcome by grief, self reclamation and the love of family, blowing off the Underground's concerns pretty easily. In another world, in another time, Ethan's experience with the Sigil, and in the Ravenlands, and with the death of his brother, may have pushed him to stay home where it is safe, and he is surrounded by people that he knows and loves that he can then protect. He barely met Ashley. Let the Ravens figure out their lesser races situation. His business is here. But Ethan just isn't built that way. He can't forget Ashley's offer. He can't ignore the lesser races. And he certainly can't forget that Artor is dead. Ethan is written very consistently in this scene. He is somber, overcritical, serious, and in contrast, we have Kai, who previously hasn't gotten a lot of screen time. Kai's previous biggest moments were in issue one, when he and Artor dumped water on Ethan, and when he pulled Brawn off of Ethan in issue two. Despite this lack of role in our story so far, Kai is actually also written consistently. He is a man of action. It may have been the two brothers dumping the water, but it was Kai holding the bucket and it was Kai who was bold enough to pull Braun back and put a blade to his throat. Kai isn't a thinker, which is literally exemplified when he tells Ethan that he thinks too much. And he's going to inherit the throne. And he doesn't even give that much thought either. Just a, yeah, I'm a big king. That's just how it is. Let's move on. Later on in this issue, Kai will actually pull another knife from his belt to press it into another person's throat. And the rest of the family is unarmed. Whether he was trained to be a fighter or he just is one, Kai is ready to throw down whenever and wherever. A stark contrast to Ethan's more cerebral nature. It's a good balance, both conflicting and complimenting, and I dig it. I also like that the brothers plant this tree themselves. This is a task that could easily have been left to a servant or a gardener, but no, Ethan and Kai do this with their own hands. There are no tools present in the scene, just the two men. So maybe someone else dug the hole, but I still think it shows how much Artor meant to them that they chose to make the time to do this themselves. I would have appreciated the storytelling focus being a bit more on Artor, though, rather than these two's personal problems. And I get it, the book needs to move forward, but... I kind of picture a ghostly image of Artor standing in that grove, maybe lecturing one of them when they were kids about one of their ancestors and how they died and what it means to him, or what it should mean to them because maybe they were younger and they didn't get it. Just, just bring a little emotion into the scene, you know? Because otherwise, this scene is fairly dry. While both of the brothers do feel somber, they also feel like they're moving on already. And I don't know, I have a younger brother. If he was suddenly killed, I think I would have a hard time, like, for a while. Especially if I blamed myself for it. I don't think I would be ready to just move on with the rest of my life after a day. Right away, the artistic change from the usual sharp, detailed pencils of Jim Chung is evident. Leonardi has a much softer style in general, but Kessel inks over him pretty tightly. The sketchiness of Spider-Man 2099 is not present here. This is very clean and very polished looking. 
Ethan still looks young, but his face is more square. He looks more like 21 here than in any of Chung's drawings so far. Kessel also varies the line weight of his inking, using it to make the characters stand out against the thinly inked backgrounds. Blue and white are the standard colors for the Heron household, so both men wear leather or dark tops, which are beautifully shaded and colored. The backgrounds are left fairly sparse and empty, keeping the focus on our two leads and giving plenty of room for dialogue-filled word balloons. Paul Mount keeps the background colors fairly muted as well. There are a lot of grays and blue-greens, but they aren't bright and vibrant colors. They exist, yes, but they are very subtle. Mounts also does this odd effect with the grass, adding what looks like a 3D texture, or maybe a picture of grass, but then inserted into the drawn scene. This does provide a varied look to the ground, with differing shades of green and brown and lots of detail, but it does look a bit out of place. It kind of looks like someone cut a pattern out of a different art book and then pasted it into this one. I adore the subtle color work, though. This is very pretty to look at. Paul Mounts does an absolutely amazing job coloring this issue, and I can't give him enough credit for it. As Ethan and Kai approach a church or cathedral kind of building, Skink meets them at the wide steps that lead in. He tells them both that they're, meaning the family, ready. Ethan asks how his parents are doing, and Skink gives a quick report. King Dane knows that he needs to be a king right now, so he is doing his best to be stoic and strong. The queen is, well, about how you would expect the queen to be after losing her son. Skink looks up at Ethan. What about you? How are you holding up? As well as he can, Ethan says, considering that he blames himself. They enter the building. Colorful banners hang from the ceiling. Lights float in golden receptacles. A single hovering camera is in the air, watching the royal family. A silver metal casket, open-faced, hovers at the front of the building, surrounded by flowers. In it is Artor's body, dressed in green, with his hands folded over his stomach. There is no image of a god or a Christ-like being to be seen. We do not know who the herons worship, if they worship anybody. There are statues of herons, though, their pointed wings opening behind them for flight. Seated in the front pew is King Dane, Queen Mariella, and Princess Elena. The rows behind them are filled, and everyone sits silently. We don't know a lot of people in the Heron lands, but I can recognize the blacksmith who made Ethan's sword sitting a few rows back. Skink takes a seat in the row behind the family as Ethan gently touches his father's hand. It's done. King Dane thanks them both. Artor would appreciate it. Ethan next grabs his mother's hands, promising her that they'll get through this. She assures him that she knows that they will. Ethan then sits down next to Elena, telling her to be strong. They all need to be strong now. Seated, his blue eyes finally settle on Artor's face, and his face gets a little hard. Behind him, Skink stares at Ethan. This will make you stronger, he whispers. And behind Skink is a creepy-looking middle-aged white guy, a curious finger resting on his chin as he watches the prince. With stooped shoulders, King Dane stands and moves to a stage that is just behind the coffin. A thin golden microphone extends from some kind of AV unit behind him, and it stops just before the king's mouth. Dane then speaks of the tragedy of Artor's death. Not only has the Heron royal family lost their son... But the people have also lost a future king. Dane knows that he's still lucky. He has his wife and their three surviving children. But any joy that he feels because of them is tempered by their own grief. Any death is a tragedy. And most tragedies just happen. They simply are. But not this one. This one has a cause. And it is the cruelty of the Raven Kingdom. The Heron people must remain steadfast. They won a single battle, but the war still looms. Let them use Artor's death as a rallying point, something to fight for. Today, yes, they mourn this loss. But tomorrow, they turn their thoughts to vengeance and war. 
a good percentage of the mourners are roused enough by this to pump their fists into the air, shouting declarations of vengeance or cursing the ravens. Dane gently brushes a lock of Artor's hair and wishes him farewell. Then he kisses his son's forehead and steps back. The rest of the royal family does the same, kissing Artor and saying their own goodbye. Finally, the lid of the coffin slides shut, and the ceremony ends. Mars has Skink basically intro us to this scene. King Dane must act in the role of king right now, not really in the role of father, and so he seems very controlled here, very calm. He doesn't cry, he doesn't break or sob. His words are heartfelt and emotional, sure, but he also knows that the eyes of the Heron Nation are on him in this moment. He needs to be strong, and so he is. But we can see the weight on him. Before Ethan touches him, he is sitting in the pew with slumped shoulders, his eyes closed, and when he stands, his shoulders are still stooped. Queen Mariella and Elena both keep their eyes down for the most part. Mariella is referenced at one point in the actual speech, and we can see the tears that she is holding in her eyes. She is hurting, but like her husband, she knows that there's more to this moment than just her pain. They need to rally their nation. And so Dane does. It has been about 20 years since I first read this comic. I don't know how many years it's been since the last time that I reread it, but I have to say, I got choked up reading this. I didn't quite make it to crying, but Mars writes this scene honestly and very well. I liked seeing the blacksmith there. Uh, that was a nice nod to continuity that I would not have expected Leonardi to put in as an artist. But we also have this mysterious creeper guy watching Ethan. And we are meant to see him. This isn't me seeing somebody in the background and just being suspicious of him. Other than Skink, he is the only person fully colored in his first panel, and later on, when Dane is rousing the gentry, he gets a whole panel dedicated to his smarmy smile. This dude just reeks of suspiciousness, if not outright sinisterness. I liked the check-ins with the royal family that Ethan did, although I kind of wish that he had done it in reverse. It would have just flowed better to have that moment end with King Dane, and then Dane gets up to make his speech. It feels slightly awkward to put our attention on Dane first, but then spend panels talking to Mariella and Elena, both of whom barely respond, and both of whom have very little role in this story. Elena continues to be a wallflower in this book. And once more, I have to mention the coloring. We've moved inside, and the lighting here is all artificial. They're all yellow golden lights, and the coloring matches that perfectly. Artor's coffin shines in the light. When Dane speaks, it's as if stage lights are pointed at him. The audience members all have very dim lights on them, but the highlights make sure to stand out as if there was a candle floating just off panel. And before we enter the cathedral, there are these stone pillars that hold up the front of the building, and the coloring on them... My god. I'm still not sure how those were colored. Their base is a pale green, but then it has mottled gold running through it like thick, flaky marble, uh, with bright lines of highlight running up them so they look shiny, they look polished and clean and ornate, and it gives this building a real air of importance. They're just super pretty. Perhaps my only complaint about this scene is that the entire funeral was basically assembled and then Ethan and Kai either left to plant that tree or, while everyone else was gathering, they did that on their own and then made everyone else wait. And they're the royal family, so I'm sure that no one is complaining verbally, but it seems like a bit of a jerk move to have all of these people gather up and sit still and then be utterly silent until the princes finish whatever it is that they're doing. I would have fallen asleep waiting, I'm sure, and I know that's rude, but if it's quiet and warm and I don't have anything to do, I can fall asleep sitting up, sure. Even if it is rude and insulting. Within the family's private crypt, letters suddenly burn themselves into a golden plaque that sits at the front of Artor's tomb. Upon the stone block is a statue of Artor, dressed in armor, wielding a sword and shield, standing bravely. Dane looks up at this image. What happened up there 
meaning in the cathedral, was for the people. This? He clicks a button on a golden brazier, and a holographic image of a golden heron appears above it. This is for them. You will be avenged, he promises. Ethan steps up to his father. Vengeance should be his to get. He will find Braun, and he will make him pay in blood. They all understand Ethan's desire for revenge, Dane says. He even feels it himself. But they just got Ethan back. He can't risk another son on some quest for something like revenge. Ethan argues that he has to do this. He was the one who set this all in motion. He has a responsibility to see it to its end. Kai jumps the line, though. As the heir to the throne, it should be him hunting down Braun. He is the oldest. He is the most responsible. But he can't do it, Ethan argues back. As the heir to the throne, the kingdom needs him. What if their father dies? The war needs him. Ethan, though, he doesn't have to be here. He's free to go in terms of his responsibilities. Queen Mariella moves to Ethan. She brought Artor into this world. She has no interest in losing another child, no matter how much she wishes for Artor to be avenged. A new voice now joins the conversation, suggesting that Ethan is needed more here. Ethan and Kai turn, discovering the creepy dude that I mentioned earlier. He is tall and thin, with high cheekbones and a wrinkled forehead. His hair is combed over to his right, and it is a sandy blonde in color. He has on a leather military-style jacket, with a red sash cutting over his chest. It is pinned to him with a yellow ornament. An ornament that looks a lot like the yellow half of Ethan's sigil. Honestly, other than somehow sneaking into a very private area of this building and appearing behind this group without getting their attention at all and looking creepy, he is fairly harmless looking. But he still shouldn't be here. In seconds, Kai draws a knife, which was not drawn on him earlier, I did make sure to look, and backs the stranger up against the wall. Explain yourself, or we'll be burying more than just my brother today, he threatens. The man apologizes for intruding, but it was important that he spoke with them. Dane calls Kai off. Give this man a chance to explain himself, at least. Although, he had better like what he hears. Kai steps back and the man fixes the lay of his jacket. He apologizes again and introduces himself. His name is Burned Rex, and that is spelled B-E-R-N-D-R-E-C-H-T. And no, I have no clue what that is supposed to mean. Like, this literally just sounds like Burned Rex, as in, those exploded ships are now Burned Rex! So maybe this guy is a, a pilot of some kind, or he used to be on a boat? I have no idea. It's it's one of the most cartoonish names in a book of cartoonish names. Uh, and on the one hand, I love it, and on the other hand, I hate it. But we'll see, I guess. Skink waves a lantern that is hanging from a pole at Rex, asking if they know each other. Rex barely looks at Skink, saying no, but Skink is sure that they've met. Rex is quite confident that they have not. He is a stranger here, new to the Heron lands. In fact, he's here to offer his services as Counselor of War. Dane folds his arms. So you want to help us against the Ravens? Against the Ravens, yes. The Herons need him, he says, pointing out that they haven't gone to war in centuries. They only wanted Point Corday because they had surprise on their side. In fact, the Prince's gift could be the very thing that they need to turn the tide of the war. Ethan rolls up his sleeve, displaying the sigil. You mean this thing? All it's done so far is make his life worse. Ethan doesn't even know what it is, or where it came from, or honestly what it can do. Rex leans in, fascinated by the sight of it. The sigil could be a potent weapon in the war. It could mean victory to either side. A little weirded out by this, Ethan starts to cover the sigil back up. Quite frankly, sir... I don't think that it's any of your business, he says. Before he can fully cover the sigil, though, Rex reaches out and grabs Ethan's bicep. Oh, he says, you'll find that it is. And then he screams as a blast of yellow energy erupts from him, jumping into Ethan's sigil. 
As this happens, Ethan's pupils disappear and glow yellow. His hair billows out. Rex falls back, crumbling onto the floor. Skink's eyes go wide, seeing this. King Dane shouts, asking, what did Ethan do? Ethan looks at the sigil and says that he didn't do anything. That just happened. But, you know what? He feels better somehow. Rex starts to pick himself up, groaning. Well, he sighs. That was interesting. Ethan asks him if he's okay, and Rex confirms that he's drained, but he'll live. He adds that he didn't mean any harm. He only wants to help them understand what Ethan is capable of. This time, Ethan does roll his sleeve down. Another time, then. He then walks over to his father, telling him that he still means to avenge Artor. Dane argues this, unwilling to lose another son, but Ethan uses his own speech against him. Dane said that they were in mourning, and that tomorrow they would turn their thoughts towards revenge, yes? Well, as a subject of this realm, doesn't Ethan have a right to avenge Artor's death in his own way? Dane is now caught between being a father and being a king. He didn't like using Artor's death as a rallying idea, but the Herons haven't gone to war in 200 years. They need to know the costs of it. Artor's death solidifies their support, and killing Braun would intensify that support. But what if the other thing happened? What if Ethan gets captured or gets killed? He can't just make that kind of decision easily. There are a thousand reasons to forbid this action. But there are also a thousand more to endorse it. And Ethan has a habit of doing what he thinks he has to, no matter what. And King Dane then references the story of Ethan saving his horse from a snowstorm when he was a child. So now he turns to Mariella, asking her how she feels about this. She does not want Ethan to go, honestly. But he isn't a child anymore either. He has to make his own decisions, and if, he su- and if he decides to go, then she'll support him. Ethan places a hand on Artor's tomb, swearing on it. He'll leave in the morning then, and he'll avenge his brother. The next morning, Ethan, Skink, and Kai are meeting at the Remembrance Trees. Ethan and Skink are dressed for the road, a large backpack on Skink's back. Kai hands Ethan his sword. You're gonna need this. Ethan attaches it to his belt. Yeah, considering I'm going to kill a man with it. Kai then warns Ethan about going in half-caught. That thing on his arm could make him overconfident, and Braun is not an enemy to be underestimated. They hug, and Ethan promises that if they need him, he will return. The brothers say their goodbyes, and then separate. Ethan pauses for just a moment to look at Artor's tree. He pulls out the green jewel that he got from Ashley. Ethan gives it a squeeze in his palm and then tucks it away. And then he's on his way. So, okay, we've actually got a lot that I want to talk about here. First off, I like that the family has a small, private little thing for themselves. Let the public feed on the righteous indignation of this death. They just need a moment to be sad. But then, but then they kind of ruin it by going right into all this revenge talk. I get it. This is a medieval society. Honor is a big part of their culture. But you just put the man in the ground, Ethan. How about you calm the floop down? And I've always been thrown by the idea that these two countries are going to war, so there will be more clashes, but Ethan just wants to cross the Great Sea again, which almost killed him, travel through enemy territory again, which almost killed him, break into his prey's fortress castle home, which wounded his face and, in theory, could have killed him, and then fight Braun again when you could just stay home and fight the war. Why not just go to war and fight Prince Braun on the field of battle? Admittedly, there is a lot of risk that he could get killed by some rando soldier, But what are the risks that you're found by raven citizens who hate the herons? Or you're found by more bounty hunters? Or you're found by soldiers? Or monsters? Or whatever it is when you sneak through the raven lands? Or maybe you hit another storm in the sea, crossing, and you drown this time. 
This plan of action just feels stupid to me. But the trade-off there is that honor is not a big part of American culture, and it sure doesn't mean much of anything to me personally. So of course, I don't get the motivation here. Ethan's impassioned pleas make it clear how much this means to him, though, and really, that is what matters to our story. My personal feelings don't come into this. Ethan's personal feelings come into this, and it's important to remember that Avalon's culture is not Earth's culture. Burned Rex just showing up here is one of those, if you were reading more than one question title, you would have some more context to his reasons for being here kind of thing. You see, there is a race of gods, or, or godlike beings, in the Christian universe who are called the First. The First believe that they created the universe, and that they were the first beings willed into existence, and that they made the worlds that make up the universe. Long ago, the First were split into two camps. The symbol of each of those houses is one half of the sigil. The yellow side is called House Dexter, while the red is called House Sinister. Having watched these sigil bearers pop up with no explanation across the galaxy wearing their symbol, they have begun to investigate. And Rex has been sent to Avalon in order to investigate Ethan. When Dane confirms if he means to help them win against the Ravens, Ron Mars pulls the same trick that Exeter pulled back in issue 3, where Rex says... This is what you want me to be involved with? Yes, that is exactly why I am here. I'll do it, so that he can accomplish his own personal goals. Rex is not worried about the Herons winning the war. He is thinking about his house winning their struggles against House Sinister, and how Ethan Sigil could tip the balance towards House Dexter. We see this hinted at again when he says that Ethan Sigil could help tip the balance of the war. He isn't referring to the Herons versus Ravens, he's referring to Dexter versus Sinister. We heard the first mentioned back in issue one when the creator complained that the first were doing nothing to keep the universe energized, and the mentor suggested creating the Sigil Bearers to motivate the first into doing something. And here we are, with the first doing something. But we also have Skink maybe recognizing Rex. And the creator and the mentor were both orange-eyed, and so is Skink. So does he work for them? Did they make him? Does he know of the first? If he doesn't, why would he insist that he recognizes Rex? Well, if you want to know, buy more books. If you were, you would also know that, upon physical contact or by intentionally willing it, a sigil bearer can absorb energy from a member of the first. And yeah, they can absorb enough energy to kill a member of the first. So when Rex touches Ethan's arm, that happens automatically, infusing Ethan with energy. That's why he feels better. So Ethan then wins his family's permission to go avenging, despite not really presenting a new or more compelling argument. Much like with Ethan crossing the sea in issue 5, there are no real stakes to this scene. If his family says no, Ethan would just sneak out anyway. Remember, he was forbidden from looking for that horse when he was a kid, and he did that anyways. But wouldn't it have been more interesting if that had happened? If Dane had forbidden it and Ethan had to sneak out of the castle? Maybe he would run into Kai, and then Kai would like let him go and be like, Hey, I know you need to do this, and I know Dad doesn't approve, but I approve. I will fully admit that that kind of seed would not have fit into this issue, meaning that it would need to be in our next issue, and that kind of derails our narrative, but it does feel a little more interesting than just, yeah, I guess go for it. But that would honestly just be drama for the sake of drama, and not necessarily because the story needs it. We want to see Ethan fight Prince Braun, and Mars puts us on that path again very quickly. This is also the official end of Trade Paperback Volume 1, the end of our first story arc, and overall, I do think that it works well as a bookend. Mars closes out our main conflict, which is Ethan trying to prevent the war. He has set up new plot lines to explore, like returning to the Raven Lands, hunting and killing Brawn, maybe finding Ashley, maybe dealing with burned Rex, and set us on a new journey. But before we return to Ethan and his story we get a little bit of a palate cleanser issue. Issue 8 of Scion opens at a bar. 
and our introduction to that bar. Wow. Talk about fan service. A busty redhead with a very low-cut blouse and some noticeable nips is the entire first page of Scion issue 8. That's it. There's nothing else there. She asks someone off-panel if they see anything that they like. And once we turn the page, we get a two-page spread that gives us a better overall view of the bar. There are all manner of people there, men and women gossiping, with the lesser races bussing tables and delivering drinks. These particular lesser races have long, kinda like dog faces, with dark brown hair covering their bodies. As we move to the right side of the page, we find a handsome enough young man leaning on the bar's counter, asking the redhead if there are any specials on the menu. She says that the weather's pretty bad, so they've got all night to explore the possibilities. The guy smiles. He's worked up quite an appetite. The woman replies that she's sure they can find something to satisfy him. Thankfully, that conversation is interrupted by the door opening. As it does, it knocks into one of the lesser race's servers, and they drop their tray. One of their cups shatters. Purple drink floods the floor, and he drops down to start cleaning it. As he does, he looks at who entered and freezes. Standing in the doorway is Prince Brawn. A black cloak is wrapped around him, but cold rainwater runs down his scowling face. One of the other bar patrons whispers his name, Prince Braun, identifying him for any new readers. Braun rocks into the center of the room and pulls out a small device. When he activates it, a holographic picture of the slave that we saw in issue 3, the one who told Braun about the failed search for Ethan, appears. Braun announces that he's looking for this. He is one of Braun's slaves, and he escaped. Braun suspects that he might be connected to the underground. He might even be on his way there now. If anyone here has information on him, you best share it now. There is no response. Braun scans the crowd. No one? He deactivates the picture and looks at the still kneeling lesser races member. You... He then stomps on his hand, and the lesser race member screams. I want to know what you know. The member begs, please, master, nothing. I don't know anything. But Braun leans in. Blood gushes out from under his boot. Answer me. A voice shouts for him to stop. When Braun turns, we see the redhead again, looking horrified and scared. Do you know something? Braun asks, heading towards the bar. When the woman stutters, Braun reaches across the bar and grabs her by the hair, using it to yank her forward. She cries out, but he doesn't even flinch. Do you know something? Tears are in her face as she answers. She saw him this morning. He was passing through. Was he on foot? Braun asks. Yes, headed north, she says. I didn't help him at all. Please, that's all I know. Finally, he lets her go, and the redhead falls back. That had better be the truth. If he learns that someone here lied, or withheld information from him, he will come back and burn this place to the ground, after making sure that each and every one of you are inside. He then exits, and outside, Prince Court waits on a large lizard mount. Did he learn anything? Braun stomps through the mud to his own lizard. North, he says simply. Court glares at him. Father won't be happy about them leaving the keep during a war for this. But Braun doesn't care. It is not his slave that escaped, now is it? He climbs aboard his mount, cursing that an underground member was in his chambers. This slave could have any kind of secrets that he has taken with him, and Braun will not be seen as a fool who couldn't command his own slave. They only go home when this thing is spitted on his blade. And if they're lucky enough to find the underground while they're at it, so much the better. This issue basically guest stars your boy Prince Braun. Like I said, this is a palate cleanser, giving us a break from Ethan and the Herons, while fleshing out Braun and the Raven lands a little bit more. In this scene, we see a pretty even ratio of men and women, black and white, inside of the tavern. 
One of the women is holding up a digital display to another patron, and he is responding to that, no, he hasn't seen him, indicating that she is looking for someone. So, she has agency and the ability to travel or look for this person on her own. This woman isn't dependent on someone else for her well-being, so despite this being a medieval fantasy world, women can be pretty independent. But, we also see the barmaid clearly trying to work it, and I won't lie, that throws me. Her dialogue really makes her seem like she is selling sex. Look at our menu, find something you like, she sounds like a prostitute which I don't have a problem with inherently. I would totally believe that a woman working at a tavern or a bar might either sell sex on the side in order to make a little money, or as part of the tavern's business services kind of thing, you know, share a split of your cut with the house. But this comic has also been really sex-free up to this point. Like, we don't even have a romance element to this book yet. Sure, we did have Ashley in her rather small leather vest top, but she wasn't presenting herself as sexy or coming on to Ethan or leaning over a horse so that her cleavage was really visible. She doesn't feel like she's supposed to be a romantic or sex interest character at this point in the story. So having this woman be the first thing that you see opening this book is just really weird for the tone of this series. My best guess, though, is that A, the majority straight white male audience who buys this kind of comic also doesn't mind being pandered to, hence fan service, and B, by presenting this woman to us sexually, Mars is hoping that we will fall for her. Even if the only emotional bond that we form with her is lust, it does invest us in her. And so when Braun attacks her, that feels shocking, that feels hurtful. If we just followed Braun into the bar and watched this happen and then he left, this would feel a lot less awful to us as an audience. We would know intellectually that it was bad to do these things, but we wouldn't feel it emotionally. I would argue that doing this kind of story technique by using lust instead of actual affection also isn't terribly great writing. I would much rather this had been a young couple on the run, or maybe they were just on a date or something like that, as opposed to a business transaction, but get what you get. This is what we are presented with, so this is what I must critique. We also see that the only lesser racist people here are the workers. I would argue that paying three employees a living wage in a fantasy tavern probably isn't very sustainable, but having three slaves who don't have a choice in the matter is sustainable. They all keep their heads down, their eyes are downcast, they aren't speaking unless it is to apologize to someone else or deliver a drink. However, when Braun starts to abuse the one, our barmaid does speak up to her credit. She is clearly upset about Braun hurting the slave, and this is the first time that we have seen a raven citizen's feelings in regard to the lesser races outside of Ashley. While the ravens might not mind the lesser races being slaves and doing work, at least in this bar, some of them still don't approve of brutalizing them as part of their role. And I love the fear that the tavern patrons have here. Braun just stands in the door. He doesn't even say anything. He doesn't do anything. He's just there. And everything stops. No one bows or worships, or even tries to suck up to him. They are more scared of him than they respect him. Clearly, Braun's perpetual bad mood is so famous that even the citizenry know of it, and they have cause to fear it. I also like having the slave from issue 3 making a reappearance in this. I love seeing continuity referenced. Uh, anything that gives a shout out to the past in a comic book is great to me. If you have read everything in a comic up to this point, then you know that this person has been shoved around by Braun, literally physically and verbally, probably emotionally, and that they have a good reason to flee. But if you haven't read all of these issues, then all you're told is that a slave escaped and this vexes Braun. You're able to follow the story, you're just maybe a little less emotionally invested. I'm not quite sure what secrets Braun thinks that this guy could have. Like, Braun is upset that this person had access to his personal chambers, but what does that mean? Does Braun leave his dirty clothes lying around? His, his medieval porn collection? 
Does he have a huge pile of documents labeled war effort with a big red stamp on it that says secret? So this dude's seeing your underwear. whoop de doo who cares, man? There are also some fun Easter eggs in this issue, too. When we get the two-page spread of the bar, there are several figures right in front of the camera who are filling the foreground. Two of those faces were cross-gen employees. They are actually Cortland Whited and Mike Beatty. We also have a slightly more recognizable pair for comic book fans. Professor Charles Xavier and Wolverine from the X-Men are sharing a table. Sure, they're dressed in fantasy raven wear, but you can't tell me that bald guy with steepled fingers and that guy with the wolf-like hair is not Professor X and Wolverine. Plus, Scion is a story that deals with the oppression of a genetically different group of people, a theme that the X-Men are built upon. Jim Chung drew one issue of Uncanny X-Men prior to working for CrossGen, but I would recognize his interpretation of those faces anywhere. The following morning, we find our runaway, who we'll eventually learn is named Nock, N-O-K, dashing through the woods. This bit of forest is not the pleasant utopia that Ethan woke up in. No, this area is rocky, the trees have no leaves, and gnarled roots jut out from the ground. Nock's clothes, still a brown vest and blue pants with no shirt, are torn and scratched. Small scratches litter Nock's body as well, evidence of his flight. He is dirty, he is tired, and he pants as he continues to run. Through a break in the trees, on the other side of some brambles, he spies a stone ruin. Close. I'm close. An arrow suddenly passes through his knee. Nock screams in pain and falls to the ground. Prince Court, a smoking crossbow in hand, approaches on Lizardback. Nock twists around, begging Court to spare him. He has always been kind to him. Please, his wife and child are waiting for him. He just wants to get back to them. Please spare me. Braun responds before Court can, saying that Court isn't going to kill him. He is. Braun's mount approaches Nock, sniffing his wound. Nock begs for mercy from Braun now, but the prince cuts him off. Why are you lesser races? Always begging for mercy. The only mercy that he offers is a swift death, and that's only if he tells Braun where the underground sanctuary is. Nock somehow manages to stand up. Master, he'll... he'll tell you... Nothing! Psych! And he bolts. Court tries to spin his mount around to follow, but his lizard is too slow. Braun charges past on his, shoving past Court, telling him to stay out of the way. Nock pushes through the brambles, well, falls out of them, more like, and as he tries to stand, Bronze Mount runs him over. But Nock can't give up. Moaning, hurt, shaken badly, he fights to get back up. Bron hops off of his mount and stands above Nock. He then rants about how Nock should be grateful to him for housing him, for feeding him, for clothing him. But no... He repaid Braun by stealing his secrets and giving them to the underground. Braun draws his blade. The underground will fail, you know. First they'll beat the herons, and then they'll root the underground out like the vermin they are. Pushing up to an elbow, Nock curses Braun and his family. They won't be kept as slaves forever. They'll fight back. They will rise up and... Braun shoves his sword into Nock's head. For a moment, everything is quiet and calm. The work is done. Braun then pulls his blade out and wipes off the blood. Filth, he mutters. Someone speaks from behind him. It was easy, wasn't it? Braun turns, looking up at the ruined set of stairs behind him. The speaker is positioned in front of the sun, blocking out their identity. But then again, they add, You've never found murder terribly difficult. Ashley descends the stairs, dressed similarly to when she saved Ethan. She snarkily asks why a raven prince is hunting a lone slave while a war is going on. Braun glares at her. I could ask the same of you. I don't believe in it, Ashley says. There are more important things to focus on. Braun has long thought that the Underground had spies in the keep, but he never suspected that one of them 
was his own sister. Ashley looks at Nock's body. Nock served Braun faithfully for years, and you didn't even learn his name. It was Braun's cruelty that drove Nock to the underground. He only fled in order to be reunited with his family. Did Braun even know that he had a family? She asks. Sneering, Braun answers, I didn't care. Then Ashley steps in closer. She didn't get here in time to save Nock, and that will haunt her forever. But she'll let this murder go, this time, because they're family. But if he ever comes back here again, he won't leave alive. That actually makes Braun smile. Why, Ashley, is that a threat? No, she replies coolly. That's a promise. Turn around. Braun surprisingly does so, and finds that his mount is dead, filled with arrows. There was no sound, no scuffle, no warning sign that this happened. Ashley tells him that this is the only warning that he's going to get. Don't ever come back here, or we'll kill you. But Braun doesn't listen to this warning. He has moved over to the side of his mount and pulled out one of the arrows. He snaps it in frustration. What is going on here? He asks. When Ashley doesn't reply, Braun turns again, demanding that she answers. Ashley... It's gone. Well, sorry, Nock. Obviously, the biggest deal to our overall story is confirmation that Ashley is part of the Raven royal family. I personally never found this reveal to be very shocking, not even when Scion was first coming out, as Mars makes this kind of obvious. Uh, she has access to the Raven Keep, access to their trained dogs, she is present at Point Corday in armor that looks very similar to bronze. She has access to tech and money in order to hide the lesser races. Yeah, who could she have been other than the princess? If you didn't pick up on it, don't feel bad. Neither did Braun, and he lives with Ashley. I love Ashley's cold demeanor here, though. She feels very much like the same person who was interacting with Ethan. Her main concern is helping the lesser races, and everything else doesn't matter. Not Ethan or his family, not even Ashley's own family. That's hard, man. That's real hard. Braun is also really well written here. And I don't mean to say that I like his behavior, I mean that I like that his behavior is consistent. Braun injured the lesser racist guy at the start of the issue, and that person pleaded for mercy, and now we have Nock pleading for mercy. And Braun just doesn't get why. He doesn't understand that he is causing them pain because their pain doesn't matter. All that matters is his pain and how he feels. Ultimately, Braun is selfish, indulgent, as shown by this quest during a war which everyone seems to remind him of, even Ashley who doesn't even care about the war, and he is cruel. That is a good character balance for our main man, Ethan, who has spent all seven issues wondering about his own behaviors and which thing to do is the right thing to do. Ethan doubts whether or not he is good enough, which in turn always pushes him to be a better person, while Braun thinks that he is the best person he possibly can be, and so he doesn't question anything that he does. We even see him basically dismiss Court, and I like to think that Court chose to stay behind. He clearly thinks that this mission is stupid, as he pointed out that their father wouldn't approve, and he winged Knot instead of killing him outright, and he sure didn't look like he was moving to hurt or apprehend Knock very speedily. He shot Knock and then just sat there. Braun's little rant here also addresses the idea of the benevolent slave owner. This was a common thought process for slave owners, the idea that them having slaves was good for the person being enslaved. They were housed, they were clothed, they were fed, and by God, if the cost of that was that you had no personal freedom of your choices, your lifestyle, or even your own body, then that was what it meant. Yes, in America, there were slaves who appreciated this system and personally profited off of it, sometimes by turning on their fellows, but there is no such thing as benevolent slavery. A slave owner can choose to kill a slave at any time and face no repercussions. 
They could feed them or starve them as they liked. And if a slave had problems with their working conditions or their food or their clothes, it didn't matter because they didn't matter as people. And we can see that Braun doesn't even try to be benevolent to his slaves. He physically grabbed Nock in issue three, shouting angrily into his face before throwing him onto the floor. He broke the hand of the character at the start of this issue. That wasn't even his slave to damage, nor did he offer the owner payment for the damage. Braun doesn't care what life is like for a member of the lesser races, so long as they keep their place below his boot. This is villainy at its finest, and it's this slight twist to Braun's personality that he thinks that he is noble and just in his actions that keeps him from being a very one-note bad guy. This is what makes Braun fascinating, but it also absolutely makes him evil. Now, yeah, Braun came in for the finishing move, but I like to think that maybe even Court doesn't really approve of this. But... He also knows that defying Braun is a dangerous thing to do. So when Braun tells him to stay out of the way, he does so, and pretends that this has nothing to do with him. He is practical and prudent, maybe a bit of a coward, where Braun and Ashley are both hardliners for what they believe is right. I'll always wish that Nock had made it, though. He was right on the underground's doorstep, and not one of them stepped out to help him. Braun was basically alone in this field, armed with only a sword. Bum rush the sh no swearing head guys fill him. Like, why would you shoot his mount with arrows when you could just shoot him? Come on! Maybe Ashley got there too late, but I find it hard to believe that the underground wouldn't have spy cameras or lookouts or somebody keeping watch on this. <sighs> Poor guy. During its lifespan, Crosschen did release two statues, and one of them is of Ashley, and she stands guard over a still-living knock. So while he may be dead in our narrative, he is also immortalized forever. And that's kind of sweet. That night, Princes Braun and Court are back at the Raven Keep. The king gives them both a dressing down for running off in a war to hunt down one slave. He expects these, these flights of temper from Braun, sure, but Court, you should know better than to allow your brother to drag you around. It's this kind of crap that makes him question Braun's right to inherit the throne. <sighs> well, at least it's done. Did anything useful come of this venture, he asks, looking at a stone-faced Braun. Braun says no. Nothing. Keeping the information that Ashley is with the underground to himself. Of course not, the king replies. So he moves on to their next bit of business, an introduction. A woman named Mai Shen has arrived from the far east to act as their advisor in the war. Mai Shen looks Asian with straight black hair that is cut along her jawline. She's thin and wears a red leather dress with white accents. The dress is slit up her left leg, exposing a big tribal tattoo on her outer thigh. A sword hangs from her hip, and a green half-cape is pinned over her left shoulder. The king introduces each of his sons, but he has no idea where his daughter is, as usual. Mai Shen greets them both, and reaches out to touch Braun's scar, commenting that it looks nasty. Braun catches her hand, though, simply telling her, No. She replies that she knows who gave him that scar, and she'll help him get his revenge. As she leans in, the shadows close around her face, highlighting her earrings. They are small and red, and shaped like the red half of Ethan's sigil. Speaking of Ethan, we end at the shoreline of the Eastern Lands, as Ethan and Skink land their small craft. Skink claims to not be overjoyed to be here, and Ethan comments that he has never seen Skink overjoyed. Then he pulls out the jewel that he got from Ashley. The underground help him escape the Raven Keep once before. He activates it. A holographic map manifests in the air, lighting up Ethan's face. Hopefully, they can help him get back in. So this issue ends pretty quickly, which is fine, as most of our main plot points are wrapped up at this point anyways. 
we get to learn a bit more about Braun and his relationship to Court, who is either so impressed by his older brother that he wants to follow him around, or he is scared of him, so he gets pulled into Braun's schemes anyways, however ill-advised they are. Court and Ashley were both right in thinking that their father wouldn't approve of this mission, but this scene goes a bit further than that. The king isn't just frustrated by Braun's actions, he is legitimately reconsidering Braun's right to inherit. And that's the kind of thing that you just don't say out loud to a perpetually angry, selfish a-hole of a man. It's also interesting that Braun doesn't use his knowledge of Ashley's role in the underground to win favor back from his father. Admittedly, I'm not sure how big a problem the underground really is to the Ravens, but you'd think that that would be a good way to justify this hunting expedition. Does Braun withhold this information so that he can feel superior to his father, who clearly thinks that Braun is a screw-up? Does he have his own plans for Ashley and her underground, maybe? It's hard to read a character like Braun. He's, he's very simple, and I don't mean simple as in stupid. I mean that he is direct. Whatever it is that Braun is working towards, that is his sole concern. So if he is keeping this information to himself, it is for a purpose. We just don't know what it is yet, but it is interesting. We do learn that Ashley isn't at home often, as her father complains about it as well. This re-demonstrates her commitment to the underground, and it shows how little she matters to the royal family's structure. No one is keeping track of her, she is free to roam as she pleases, while Braun's adventures are watched like a hawk. One of these two is either trusted or outright ignored, and it sure isn't Braun. And then we have Mai Shen's arrival. If you couldn't guess, having met Burned Rex last issue, Mai Shen follows the same basic story beats, but from the opposite side. She is a member of the First, and she has been sent by House Sinister. Whatever her goals are, she is allying herself with the Ravens, so that can't be good for Ethan. I want to stop for just a second to make sure that I point out that Avalon is generally presented as a world of diverse ethnicities. I remember when the Hobbit movies were coming out, people complained a lot about them being so white, the defense being that the setting was inspired by medieval Europe, and England specifically. But, A, there were dark-skinned or Asian people in Europe going back to at least the 1500s, if not earlier. The Jesuit church specifically had dealings with nations in Africa, the Middle East, China, and even Japan, which included sending back young children for training within the church. And, you know, good old-fashioned slavery for a prophet. Plus, Middle-earth is a fantasy world, so who populates it is totally up to the people creating it. And back in the year 2000, CrossGen was populating its fantasy worlds with white, black, and Asian folks, and I applaud that. It immediately makes the world feel bigger than just two white nations. Plus, it shifts the appearance of the racism that is present within the book. All of the humans that we have met so far seem to be treated pretty much the same. There isn't a difference between how Braun treats white people versus black people, or even men versus women. I mean, Braun's kind of a jerk to everybody. But we are shown that if you aren't human, if you are a member of the lesser races, then suddenly it is okay to treat you a lot worse. It's a bit academic to say, we're all human so we should all be treated the same, it is a little bit harder to argue that we specifically created a labor force to do our work for us, and now you want us to grant them rights? Look at them, they're monstrous. Why on Avalon should they have the same rights as us? The argument for equality is a little bit harder to argue when the person that you're talking about doesn't even look like you, and wasn't even created the same way you were created, however that was. So a f no swearing. Yeah, and a cross gen for their diversity game and telling a complex narrative. Sure, I will fully admit that all of their leading characters are white at this point. I'm not saying that they couldn't have improved, but they did make an effort, and they will eventually branch out into more diverse leading characters. Issue 7 overall did a solid job closing out our initial plot threads while still leaving enough of them open for the story to continue. 
Issue 8 then picked up those threads, strengthened them a bit into a slightly stronger material, and introduced some new problems that we will be dealing with moving forward. Overall, I feel like these two issues do a really good job of not only moving the story forward, but looking beautiful as well. And they're just... Ah, oh man, they're just good comics. I love it. Next week, we're bouncing over to Cross-Gen Chronicles, the company's quarterly book, as its second issue explores some of the backstory of Avalon. We have heard a lot about Edvin, Ethan's ancestor. Well, we're about to learn the truth of it. Plus, that issue strengthens one specific plot point that is going to be very important moving into the end of year one, so I feel like I have to cover it. Due to its oversized nature, though, and the sheer amount of comic that I am going to have to cover, it is going to be a solo episode. Don't worry, we will be back with the regular series soon enough otherwise. Join me in a week for Comic Book Breakdown episode 18.5, Scion, The Past is Prologue. Everyone, there are a million podcasts vying for your time and attention, and I'd like to thank you for listening to mine. If you would like to get in touch with me to share a concern, request a series, compliment me, berate me, whatever you like, send me an email at cbbreakdown at gmail.com. Otherwise, thanks for listening.